Welcome back to the Real Vision Daily Briefing, everybody. I was scheduled to be joined today by Ed Harrison, but due to the price action in Bitcoin, we wanted to cover that story for you today. I'll be reunited with Ed shortly, but now today, I'm extremely pleased to be joined by Diego Perea. Diego, welcome to Real Vision. Thank you so much for having me. I should say welcome back to Real Vision. You've been on the platform uh, several times in the past uh, with Raul, you've done some expert views. Uh, I personally have been incredibly impressed by the depth and the rigor of your work. Uh, and it's really such a pleasure to have you here. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. So let's talk a little bit first about your background. You have an extensive background uh, in trading, working at banks. You've been at Goldman Sachs, uh, JP Morgan, Merrill Lynch. You have a very deep and wide uh, background on Wall Street uh, in macro, in traditional capital markets, in trading. And I think it's so important to bring a different view here to Real Vision today to talk about what's happening in Bitcoin. Yeah. Um... Look, I think you guys are extremely savvy and well known for for the depth on the on the crypto. I've been probably more skeptical, um, and I think it's it's a good balance to to, to bring uh, different perspectives. Um, mentioned my background. I'm um, yeah, I'm an engineer by background, and I think that really shaped the way I, I look at the world. I did my masters in mineral economics, and I was uh, lucky to to join investment banking. Uh, on the macro sales and trading side, which I did for, for, for a while between London, New York, and Singapore. And then I was also very blessed to, to work on the buy side when, with very large macros. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, as, and, and what brought me to Real Vision, is I'm also a best-selling author uh, with two books, one on the energy space, another one in the, in the macro, uh, and, and both very contrarian thesis. So if, if I was to write the third book, potentially it could be about this exciting world of, of obviously gold, but also the, the crypto space and a lot of the action that's happening, which is fascinating. Yeah. You know, one of the things that really resonated with me about your work is your work on bubbles and anti-bubbles. Give us a little bit of a uh, framework for understanding how you think about it, because it seems so incredibly relevant to what's happening in the digital asset space right now. Yeah, I think uh, best to start with definitions. And um, when you think about bubbles, um, I always like to borrow George Soros' definition uh, or my interpretation of his definition, which is bubbles are effectively assets that are artificially expensive based on a belief that happens to be false. It happens to be what he calls a misconception. So it's a situation where really the, the emperor has no clothes. It's um, so what I did as, a, as an engineer is to uh, generalize the framework. And I said, well, misconceptions can distort reality, but not only through artificially expensive valuations, which we call bubbles, you could also have artificially cheap valuations, which is what I call an anti-bubble. And, and here there are uh, three dimensions, at least. The first one is this idea of assets that are grossly artificially cheap based on a misconception. So it's effectively a matter of when, not if, that they will reprice higher. The, the second dimension is, is the idea that bubbles and anti-bubbles are distorted mirror images of each other. They're two reflections of the same process, the same misconception. As a result, uh, the uh, bubble anti-bubble move occurs exactly the same time with exactly the same catalyst. So it acts in a way as a, as a hedge. And, and the third dimension has to do with risk premia, with you know being a contrarian, and and I think the typical bubble anti bubble uh, relationship, or one of, that I like to use, is the relationship between the S and P and the VIX, for example. I would argue that artificially low volatility can actually contribute to artificially high equity mm. prices. This is both through qualitative reasons such as complacency and the perception of no risk, as well as uh, quantitative reasons such as, you know, autocorrelated processes due to, uh, you know, trend following, risk parity and, and others. I think when it comes down to, to the bubble and anti-bubble debate, therefore the question is really, uh, tell me the belief, tell me the misconception, and I'll tell you what the bubble is. And I think that's 
you know, beyond the ratios and the stuff, it's really about those uh, beliefs or misconceptions which effectively create these distortions. And, uh, and that's what happens, you know, once these beliefs are, uh, become fallacies, <laughs> or they become better understood, then, uh, then these bubbles implode. Um, and, and so that's, you know, where, where I spend a lot of time focusing on. And obviously, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm not in possession of the truth. There are very complex dynamics. And so that's when I, for example, I wrote this piece, which some of you may have seen, uh, you know, Bitcoin bubble or anti-bubble. And it's not a black and white argument, although my conclusions are very skewed, uh, 80, 20 to, to the bubble versus the anti-bubble. Yeah, but even still, it is such a rich and nuanced perspective, uh, even though you tend to land in the bubble camp, the idea that it could be an anti-bubble that's mispriced to the downside at some uh, fundamental level. I know that your views uh, about debasement of fiat currency, central bank intervention, uh, MMT, some of the anything but fiat arguments uh, will be uh, music to the ears of uh, some of the folks who are in the Bitcoin space, some people who are true believers uh, in what's happening in digital assets, true believers in the store value function, the digital gold function, the digital pristine asset function. Tell us a little bit about that view. Sure, I think this is what I would call the problem. So we are, you know, I think the problem is, is, is fairly well understood. Uh, and, and, uh, the, the issue becomes when you jump from the problem to solutions that may or may not be. But uh, looking at the problem itself, uh, as I discussed in, in, in my second book, in the anti bubbles, um, there is really a situation where uh, I, I would summarize the last decade in one sentence is the transformation of um, risk free interest into interest free risk. So, what we've seen all from 2008 is a situation where in response to a crisis, you know, interest rates once upon a time were at 5%, you know, and that was considered to be normal levels. And what we've seen over the last, uh, you know, 12, 13 years is the relentless uh, process of monetary policies without limits. That first brought interest rates to zero, then we started to print money, then that brought even in Europe and Japan negative nominal interest rates. Then we started buying beyond um, uh, basically government bonds and in places like Japan, central banks have been printing money to buy equities. We know this dynamic where, you know, we're not really solving problems. The, the going back to the bubble, anti-bubble, the belief is you can actually solve problems by printing money. And the bad news is you're not solving any problems. You are in one way, you know, kicking the can down the road, which brings us into the second big uh, issue, which is, you know, first was monetary policy without limits. The second one is fiscal policy without limits. So you effectively have uh, central banks that are printing infinite amount of, of money to effectively give it to, to, the, to the government. It's, it's a process where the left pocket lends the right pocket. And, uh, and this dynamic leads to my beloved uh, country, Spain, uh, being able to finance itself in 10 years at negative nominal uh, rates. This is, is not a new normal, is not necessarily, it's not a, a, a reflection of fundamentals, is 100% artificial. You can finance yourself at negative interest rates because of a highly distorted uh, world of, of, and so this dynamic effectively, uh, it stay, it's gone to a point, and this is what it makes the current market very interesting, that by creating artificially low interest rates, by creating this financial bullying of uh, you know, investors being penalized, the, something has to give. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we're not solving problems, we're kicking the can down the road. We are transferring these problems in the form of currency wars and trade wars. We are transforming these problems into inequality and inflation and bubbles. And unfortunately, we are enlarging these problems. So we have these fallacies, these ideas where central banks and governments are just, uh, you know, trying to print and borrow their way out of the problem. And what they're doing is they're really delaying, transferring, transforming and enlarging them. And we're now at a point where the distortion in asset uh, valuations, 
let alone the currencies, is, is equities, is fixed income, is everything. We have created these bubbles that are by now too big to fail. They are systemic. So the big issue now as the central bank is you were theoretically mandated with uh, financial stability, which historically meant inflation. Today, the risk of financial stability are the bubbles that you have created <laughs> through uh, this abuse. And, uh, and basically, we're caught in this corner with central banks. If they try to normalize things and the bubbles imploded, it would be game over. It would be systemic. And so we are in this new paradigm shift where if I have to um, you know, summarize the next decade in one line, it would be the transformation of bubbles into inflation. It's as simple as that. And unfortunately, it's not even inflation. It's likely to be stagflation. Mm -hmm. This brings us into the debate of healthy inflation or reflation versus uh, more unhealthy driven by, by money printing. And so within this environment of you know uh, abuse on the monetary and fiscal side of bubbles without precedence and and too big to fail we find ourselves as investors and savers looking for for alternatives looking for exits and so there's no surprise if you combine this with technology that people are looking at, at the new world at the exponential world or whatever and looking for for some of the the um, the alternatives in the in the digital space but i think here there's a number of fallacies and threats and and misconceptions and narratives that uh really worry me and that logical jump from oh my god i have this huge problem therefore bitcoin's the solution is a big gap and one that people need to understand better right and that brings us precisely uh to where we are today um, let's just set this up a little bit. Obviously, big announcement from Elon Musk uh, last week, late in the week, uh, that Tesla would no longer be accepting Bitcoin as a form of payment for Tesla vehicles. Over the weekend, uh, additional news coming out, some, uh, some, 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 some static, I guess you could say, on Twitter. Uh, Elon Musk going back and forth, diving in with some members of the uh, Bitcoin community. Uh, and the scuttlebutt is that there is the potential, the potential, still an unconfirmed rumor, uh, that uh, Mr. Musk may begin to liquidate or already has liquidated uh, some of his position at Tesla, uh, the $1.5 billion in Bitcoin held in Treasury uh, at Tesla. Again, this is speculation. This is rumors fueled uh, by uh, Mr. Musk on Twitter over the weekend. And just to put a little bit of a framework around this, some numbers around where we are right now, uh, we're now trading at about 44,250. This is off the day's lows of about 42,000. To put that into context, the high, uh, all-time high this cycle, uh, an all-time high uh, period, 14 April, about 64,700, depending upon which index uh, you look at. Of course, there's no national best bid, best offer in crypto. So these numbers will vary a little bit uh, from one site to the next. But the bottom line is it's about a 31% sell-off uh, from the highs. With that said, let me chum the waters here just a little bit and read a tweet uh, from you from last Thursday. Uh, our own Raoul Pal uh, had tweeted uh, regarding Elon Musk. I know, I know it's crazy, but I don't think he's joking. If you want to go to Mars, you are the kind of guy that <laughs> wants his own currency. And he talks about how that would be beneficial uh, to Mr. Musk to have access to unlimited funding, to which you replied, I think, very trenchantly, Maduro in Venezuela also understands the benefits of Ponzi and created Petro cryptocurrency in 2018. Doge, Petro, evidence of BTC scarcity fallacy. Quote, there are only 21 million BTC but we can print 21 million cryptocurrencies out of thin air. Key misconception supporting the bubble. Now, I know there are going to be a lot of people uh, on Real Vision who are big fans of crypto who are going to disagree. They're probably screaming at their computer screens right now. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit uh, about your thought process in that, because you have this ability to fold in uh, not just the capital markets, but a really deep understanding of macro. Tell us a little bit how you reached that conclusion. Look, I think um, I, I come from the 
commodities world, right? And uh, that's the physicality of commodities. We always say you cannot print commodities, right? It's, it's a fact. You could print uh, equities, you can print uh, debt, you can print currencies, you can print whatever you want, uh, but you can't print physical oil or, or gold. Um, the, the interesting dynamic uh, with the, uh, when, when we jump from the problem into the, that, that we discussed is the debasement of the currencies, is inflation, is, is many things. Uh, I think one of the key uh, uh, beliefs uh, or, or misconceptions behind the, the value of Bitcoin is, is scarcity. And I am a big, uh, I'm very skeptical about this because, and I've had this discussion with incredibly smart people <laughs> where the argument is, look, there's only 21 million uh, Bitcoins, therefore we can't really uh, print anymore. They're scarce and uh, demand will be infinity. It's, you know, the ability to supply them also dec declines exponentially, therefore blah, blah, blah. My argument is, is simple. Look, there might only be 21 million uh, Bitcoins, uh, but you can actually have 21 million different cryptos. And and Dodge is just, uh, or Doggy, or however you pronounce it, uh, it's just one example of yet another com competitor that comes out of thin air, uh, in this case with, uh, with the gentleman uh, uh, behind it that is, is supporting this. And, and this goes very closely into the what I call the, the Highlanders, you know, there can only be one, right? The in in some ways, Bitcoin success relies on being the only crypto. The minute the uh, you have literally in the thousands, I, I lost count. It might be ten thousand. It's, it's almost like a joke, right? You could do uh, on the private side. We could do Ash Coin, Diego Coin, Apple Coin, whatever you want, Coin, right? And and so the the, the big jump. And the argument that people use against this is, yeah, of course, Diego, you can have 21 million different uh, cryptos. But for example, my good friend and fellow co-author of the best-selling book, uh, The Energy World is Flat, Daniel Lacalle, who is extraordinarily uh, smart, uh, would, would come back to me when I said this and said, Diego, yeah, but they have different uses. It's a bit like comparing gold and silver. And, and to that, I argued, look, in our energy book, you know, this is a book we wrote in 2014. We were challenging the status quo of, of crude oil, okay, as, as the king of, of, uh, of the energy market and, and challenged uh, monopoly. And I said, look, people don't need oil per se. We, we said this in the book. Nobody needs oil per se. Ash, you don't, come, you don't use oil. You, you, you know, what, what we need is we need reliable, cheap, uh, clean, abundant energy sources for transportation. But nobody needs oil per se. We need that product. So when you think about alternative uses that can compete directly, call it Dodge, call it whatever else, you have a bit of a, a, bit of a problem. Because the scarcity fa uh, fallacy, as I call it, effectively tells you that there is no uh, scarcity in, in the sector. You might, the second argument that I get all the time is, yeah, Diego, but look at Google. You could create a thousand Googles, a thousand searches, uh, or, or uh, a thousand Facebooks, which is true. Uh, you, you could do that. And the question is a first mover advantage. And then we move into the, the discussion of both uh, network effects and Metcalfe's law. Yeah. And for those who are not familiar with this, you know, the network effects are basically demand economies of scale. So supply side economies of scale are easy to understand. The more you produce, the cheaper uh, it, it is per unit. Demand economies of scale is, is sort of the opposite, is the more demand there's for something, the more you're willing to pay for it, okay, from the demand side. And, and that goes with Metcalfe's law, which for those who are not familiar, says that the value of a network is proportional to the square of the participants. And the big fallacy, in my opinion here, is that people confuse the value of a network with price. <laughs> it's a huge jump. Let me give you a simple example. Okay, let's say we have a telephone network with a million users. Okay, and we now introduce user number million and one. According to Metcalfe's law, the utility of the network grows exponentially because each one person can call so many more people. 
But that doesn't mean that me as the user, I'm willing to pay exponentially more for using the telephone or that the uh, telephone company will be worth exponentially more. So these fallacies, these jumps with the scarcity fallacy, the, uh, the value fallacy. I mean, I, I think a friend of mine years ago said, Diego, you know, someone came to me and offered me to do my own crypto for, for 25 grand. And this is the kind of dynamic. It's a bit like printing money from the central bank. So the scarcity fallacy, the value fallacy, the value fallacy being, you know, I didn't anticipate Dodge to, to come out, but I did anticipate something like Apple coin. Come on, guys, if Apple came out tomorrow and said, look, you can only buy Apple products with Apple coin, it would probably be worth, I don't know, how many billions? I mean, it would be just go immediately overnight. This is just an intermediary step into your work and your product. And so I think there's lots of things in this process uh, that when you go a little bit deeper and you think through, they're lost in this logical flaw. And I guess, you know, I've, I've written about this. I get a lot of uh, comments back. Generally, those are the main themes. This is my answer to them. And, uh, you know, as I said in the article in, in, uh, in LinkedIn that I published, I think in January, I opened the article with Frida Kahlo's uh, lines. I said, I don't want you to think like me. I want you to think. <laughs> and, and so the, all these arguments, which are, you know, many in both directions are, are to be taught. And you can't take these things just because Metcalfe's law sounds very scientific or ad adoption or many things to be, you know, uh, relationships that will basically go to, to the letter and this will, will, will be worth infinity. You know, I, I, I don't think so. And, and there are hundreds of other threats and considerations to this, but this is very much at the core I think of the, the dynamics of Bitcoin. If you only have one, the scarcity fallacy might be perhaps more uh, uh, real in a world where you start to have this competition, uh, everything falls apart and they all, it's, it's what I call, you know, the, the famous HODL, <laughs> the H-O-D-L. It's, it's a very simple prisoner's dilemma. This is exactly what all the Bitcoiners are uh, experiencing now. And, and they're looking at it and saying, oh shit, do I sell and I bring the this thing lower or do we all hold all up? You know, this is the prisoner's dilemma. And unfortunately, I think there are some extraordinarily emotional people around this, okay? You just need to see the exchanges. People take it almost beyond religion and they are probably very upset at me now for what I'm saying. Look, guys, I have, I don't care. You know, it's, it's I, I'm not, uh, it's it's something you should think about it and and and, and do your own judgment, but uh, this, this is something of, you know where people need to be. The minute you're so emotional, you're running to the risk of of getting married to these positions, only seeing one view of the world. And my tweet today was really about mind your leverage. Okay, so yeah. some people might be buying the dip aggressively. Uh, be careful. Don't sell puts. Don't go big time levered on futures. Don't uh, uh, borrow money to, to go long again. Don't think about mortgaging your stuff. Don't do it, okay? Even if you're correct, even if you're correct, eventually this will make you bankrupt. You are subject to potential tail risks. I mean, I can point you to many big numbers. You talked about Elon Musk, okay? Everybody knows what the average price entry was for Elon Musk. Everybody. And everybody knows that there's absolutely no way in this world that Elon Musk will take a loss on his Bitcoin holding in Tesla. It's game over for Tesla. So whoever thinks, and I run a poll asking, do you think Tesla will sell all its holdings before the end of the year? One third thought no. <laughs> Two thirds thought what I think is ine 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 inevitable. Okay. Of course, Elon will sell everything. Of course, because his car business, I mean, he made more money with Bitcoin than in the entire history of the, con the company selling cars. If you do, are so stupid to, to take so much risk and do that with your company and you made money, it was a bad decision, good outcome. But if he loses money on this, it's a bad decision, bad outcome, he gets completely destroyed. So I have no doubt, no doubt, 
that he uh, has either sold it or hedged or will sell it. And if he didn't, mine the stop because the stop, we know where he bought it and we know. And I would say something similar for Mr. Michael Taylor. He's so public about his level. I think he's 24,000. That's where the company goes negative equity. All these big egos that are just massively uh, long and building and positioned, you know, uh, to, to, to basically post the case and using that transparency in those egos, they're trapped. They can't sell, they can't change their mind. They're just in relentlessly trying to buy the dip and getting other people, I was gonna say great the fools, to, to join. But, but basically we, you need to be mindful. And, and this brings me to another key point. You know, we, we use this, uh, people use this point of Elon Musk as a huge buying point, right? When he was accepting, now is, is evil. People have also used Raquel Miller and uh, Paul Tudor Jones. Okay, I talked about this in my article. These guys don't fool yourselves. When Paul Tudor Jones bought Bitcoin at 10K, he recognized it as the fastest force in the fight against inflation. He was correct. He went up six times since he bought it. I have very little doubt, <laughs> or I'm gonna uh, think that these guys are gonna go big time short at the at the right time. And I wouldn't. I and and these guys are not married to Bitcoin. They're traders, and they will make a ton of money on the way up, and they will make a ton of money on the way down. And the problem here, and when people will blow up, is you buy it on the way up. You're very successful on the way down. You believe infallible, you start doubling up, you lever yourself up, and then by selling puts or going super leverage. And so this is a key message that I like to share. It's just, guys, be careful with leverage. But it's a complex world, and it's path dependent. Okay, so even if you're correct, you might blow up in the process. Yeah, and that really is the core structure of your argument, and it's such an important one. I think you touched on a number of key points and that I was thinking through as you were speaking. Uh, one of which is the difference in culture uh, between people who come to this uh, from a macro background, a, a trading background, an asset management background, and from people in this space uh, who really believe that this is something that has the power to change the world for the better. Uh, one of the things that I know that you're passionate about, you've spoken about it here today, uh, is about the risk uh, of ultra accommodative central bank policy that goes on indefinitely. Uh, many people in the Bitcoin space see Bitcoin as a, a key counterweight uh, against that uh, erosion of value, erosion uh, of wealth, because people can store this money uh, off the financial grid uh, in a place that cannot be cannot be uh, diluted by central bank policy. Uh, but let me ask you this, and this is a core question that I think uh, if a Bitcoiner were here, they would ask you. This is the Bitcoin maximalist position, a, a phrase that uh, Bitcoiners themselves do not like because it was coined uh, uh, by Vitalik Buterin uh, as a kind of a criticism of the view of Bitcoin being uh, the, the core asset. Um, but I think what they would say is they would agree when they listen to your argument uh, about how, although Bitcoin itself is only limited to 21 million uh, coins, 21 million uh, Bitcoin, they would say, that's precisely the point. And we agree with you that the ability to coin digital assets is theoretically infinite. And that's why we believe uh, that Bitcoin is the one true store of value. How would you respond to that? I, I talked about that. I think uh, the we, we need to think about, just like my example in oil, people didn't or don't buy oil per se. Okay, This is the mistake that OPEC and, and many other people have made in history. It's just people need my oil. Okay, no, sorry, I don't need your oil. I need cheap, abundant, re reliable, clean energy. And if you give me alternative ways to transport myself, I will. And this is why the, the oil emperor collapsed. If you think about Bitcoin and the actual service that is looking to give, the maximalist argument is precisely that. There can only be one. But you can actually achieve that same objective in many other ways. And Dodge, I think it's, I think Nicolas Taleb uh, put a very interesting tweet, uh, which uh, he said, the enemy of the evil or the devil is not a saint, is another devil. <laughs> 
And that, in a way, is a bit what happens with Bitcoin. Bitcoin's enemy is not gold. Bitcoin's enemy is another crypto. Because the other crypto that comes in shows the, the fallacies in open air. There's this tweet that I found fascinating. I loved it. It was very, very funny because you have this, I don't know the, who the two guys are, but I think they're two, uh, you know, uh, uh, very famous uh, WWF or whatever. And they're screaming at each other saying, hey, Dodge is a bubble. And the other guy says, look, by that argument, Bitcoin's also a bubble. And the guy cries, no, uh, Bitcoin is, is a Fed against, is a, is a hedge against the, uh, the Fed and the other and the other guys like saying, dude, it's the same thing. You look at it from the outside. Okay, take, take yourself, ask your grandmother. Okay, take a step back. And yes, there might be arguments, but the reality is this this um, this competition is, uh, in, in my view, critical. Now, uh, Elon Musk has taken a, uh, a stack at the energy aspect, of course. I mean, this is so obvious uh, for Elon, which actually I found very naive why he ever bought it on the first place. I mean, well, talk, I talk a little bit about this because you, you've been uh, uh, on Twitter, been very eloquent about talking about uh, the ESG nature of uh, his company and uh, some of the tax credits and some of that. That's an incredibly important point, I think, for people to understand. Look, uh, it, it touches on a few things, obviously. I mean, people like uh, uh, Michael Taylor are talking about, you know, how the institutional aspects of, of crypto and how you should actually keep a large part of your treasury in, in Bitcoin, et cetera. Uh, and, and that institutional push has been part of the, the narrative. Uh, when Elon, Elon Musk bought with Tesla, it was sort of magic, you know, because you have a technology, green, uh, modern guy, et cetera. And then this is all uh, imploded. Look, when you are uh, Elon Musk and you are effectively selling uh, green technology, electric cars, your enemy is, is fossil fuels, et cetera, and then you go into, into Bitcoin and the challenges that it has with respect to mining and, and energy usage, which, which look at the numbers yourselves, you know, it's more than Norway or, or a reasonably sized country. The, there is absolutely no way. I mean, here in Europe, we're a little bit more advanced than you guys, I think, in, in the US with respect to ESG. Our uh, regulator has already uh, imposed uh, asset managers and strategies to define their position with respect to ESG, environment, social, and governance, right? The E here is very important. So you have right. strategies, Article 4, 5, 8, whatever, that, that tell how are you dealing with this. And there's absolutely no way that an institutional investor in Europe will ever buy Bitcoin based on uh, if it's put on the wrong label, right? We're not even, some, you know, even crude oil, you know, has been in the blacklist. I mean, the ESG world is changing. But thinking about Bitcoin from an ESG perspective, uh, and people can argue, no, no, we, we produce it with, uh, <laughs> with solar, it's, it's energy is fungible, there's lots of things. Yeah. to argue against this, but the ESG angle is something that it's a big limit. And we should and say, there, I was going to say, we should say that there are those who will make the argument. Uh, Meltem Demirs uh, did, uh, we ran a piece that she recorded uh, with us at Real Vision uh, a few months ago over the weekend, making the argument that Bitcoin actually uh, soaks up excess energy that's being produced on the grid uh, and that it is encouraging, uh, it is encouraging increased development uh, in clean energy. Um, you know, to me, there is this argument that says, look, we're clearly we're converting fossil fuels uh, into hashes. And that is something that is a net negative drain. But there are those who make that argument. And they make it in a compelling way. Look, whichever way you want, I think the energy aspect is it, it's a consideration. OK, it's yeah. it's uh, it's consumes a lot of energy. It's uh, base load demand. So it's not like, oh, we only mine at night. OK, it's <laughs> like or we only mine when it's sunny. No, you mine throughout the day yep. and, and, and it's base load. But uh, but look, I think the argument with that, with Tesla in particular, it was pretty obvious. It was very questionable and really surprising to many of us, myself included, that he bought it on the first place. He was risking his uh, if, if you get put in the wrong label, think about Tesla's uh, skyrocketing performance. It's due to a number of reasons. Okay, but one of them, it's its inclusion in, in green indices. Eventually, it actually got it into the S&P. Okay? 
But when you're part of a green index, people need to buy you as part of that. And the minute you're no longer ESG or green, you drop, right? So the threat of the, the, the provocation from Elon Musk to, to a number of people by, by being a, a theoretically green company and buying Bitcoin to me was surprising. Okay, I'm not questioning, I, I think it's surprising. The fact that his exit only a few months later is based on environmental issues shows how irresponsible he was to go in on the first place. He's obviously banking in uh, uh, a lot of money in the process, I think, unless he, does, he doesn't, in which it's game over. But it's, it's not just for Elon and a green company. You can actually translate this to a number of other institutional clients. Right. I can tell you, pension funds or others, this idea that everybody will buy crypto, look, if there's any uh, environmental considerations, they have to be addressed first. And I think Elon's comments are certainly not helping that case. Yeah. You know, we've, uh, this has been a great conversation. We've absolutely blown through time here. I really want to get to some of the questions uh, that are coming to us uh, from our viewers because they're great questions. Uh, so this first one comes to us from Eric. Eric asks, Ash, can you ask Diego, if he expects stagflation, what assets perform in stagflation? I think in the 1970s, energy producers and gold. Could we also see tech continuing to flourish if we reach a stagflationary cycle? Like super, super important question. And obviously we are you know, in, in a phase where inflation is showing many faces. Okay, one that is, has been very fashionable recently is, is reflation. It's the it's effectively prices going up because demand is very strong. Okay, I would uh, argue that this reflation, it's more inflation. Inflation is about, it's not about prices going up, it's about the value of the money going down. And this is a very different type of inflation. And the worst case scenario for everybody is that you print in a lot of money, the value of money goes down, and then uh, effectively uh, prices go up because of the, the diminishing value of money, but the economy is stagnated. You know, you have unemployment, you have stuff. This is really a, a very, very terrible scenario, and there's few places to, to, to hide. But I, I think that uh, when you, you, you mentioned technology, when you think about the equities, you're going to have to think about which ones are truly uh, keeping their margin right beyond just pure uh, commodity appreciation. So uh, I think we are not quite there yet, but things are accelerating. And for the time being, I think gold is, in my humble opinion, the not only an anti-bubble for the fiat, but I think it could actually play out and be a, an anti-bubble for, for the crypto. Uh, but beyond that, there's going to be opportunities where you need to think through uh, you know, the, the two opposing forces and, and to what extent, if you think about an equity, I mean, let, let me, let me answer it. Let's, let's say, let me make it easier. Let me tell you where not to be. <laughs> okay. And then we see where you have to be, but there are a few areas where you don't want to be in an environment where inflation is going up a lot. You don't want to be in cash. You don't want to be in credit and you don't want to be in fixed income. Because the hundred dollars or euros that I will pay you back in 10, 20, 30 years are going to buy you nothing. Okay. So that's, those are the guys that are going to pay for the party. Now, if you think about what are the things that are going to do better, you're going to have to look for scarcity. You're going to look to look for, in my view, real assets. I think uh, interest rates uh, would be difficult for them to go up. I like real assets. I like land. I like real estate. With, especially with good yield, uh, you, you want gold. And, and I'm sure on the equity side, there'll be plenty of opportunities, but you need to think about where the value of the equity comes from. Right. Okay. You need to think, let's put a simple example. Okay. Uh, let's say you're a baker. Okay. And what you do, you buy wheat, you transform it and you, and you sell bread. Okay. To the extent that the price of wheat is going up and the price of bread is also going up, you will maintain or even increase your margin, who knows. But to the extent that this dynamic doesn't hold, okay, because you're, for whatever reason, then your uh, equity can actually lose value. So 
it's interesting how the relationship between equities and inflation uh, fluctuates with ranges and with sectors. But I think that was a great question. I think for now, um, I, I, it is it's not easy to find where to hide. <laughs> but I always recommend that people have, I use a football analogy, you need strikers, you need midfielders, you need goalkeepers. You need the entire team for this match. You can't just be long uh, equities and forget about defenders. Uh, you need a bit of everything in that portfolio. But that portfolio not only needs to be balanced in terms of risk on, risk off, volatility uh, components, you also need to balance inflation uh, risks. And I think you have to have uh, strikers, midfielders, and defenders that are long inflation. Say equities and gold would be an interesting combination. That That's something we like. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting. You actually perfectly anticipated the next question that I had queued up, uh, which is from one of our regular viewers, Prius Omega. Uh, are bonds and gold a bubble anti-bubble pair? And I think you addressed exactly that point. Yeah, look, it's fascinating because in, in the bond market, I would differentiate between, let's say, the bond in Europe, which is already at negative nominal yields and negative real yields. Uh, versus the treasuries. The treasuries, you know, th there's, uh, I believe, and the textbook says that if inflation comes, interest rates will go up. This is this is the conventional wisdom. This is what the te textbook says. I would argue, and this has been my contrarian view for a while, that no, you're going to have inflation and zero rates. Because if you hike interest rates, you will prick the bubbles. And if you prick the bubbles, then it's game over. So the real systemic risks now are the bubbles, and therefore central banks cannot hike. So you're going to have a situation where the degree of freedom in the system, it's lower interest rates. But before that, I think when you think about the relationship between gold and, and fixed income, which has been extremely close, I think gold is significantly more asymmetric. Okay, Gold, and one of my quotes in the book, in the anti-bubbles was gold has a few hundred dollars of downside, has a few thousand dollars of upside. And that, I think it's a very asymmetric picture, which I don't think fixed income uh, has, especially in real uh, uh, terms. Yeah. Our next question comes to us from Seth. I suspect I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask the question because I think it's an interesting point for people to understand the way uh, bubbles uh, function. Uh, so Seth wants to know, uh, ask Diego if he has shorted TSLA. Um, the question here for me, what makes it interesting, is how um, it is very difficult to go short on these positions when you have no idea, you know, to borrow from Keynes, how long markets could stay irrational. Talk to that a little bit about your perspective. Absolutely. The, the short answer is I didn't. Uh, but if I had, uh, it's, out, it's outside of my mandate, basically. Um, but uh, the, what I would say is that it, it's very interesting to combine the view on equities and bubbles with uh, insurance. Okay? The answer is, if you are bearish Tesla uh, and, and you had gone short outright, many people would be bankrupt by now. Even, even if they will be eventually be correct, selling something in linear fashion has infinite downside. So nobody could have dreamt or a few people that Tesla was going to do what it did, and uh, it was it was it was, you know, it was just crazy how many how 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 things happened, right? Plus, but, you bleed you bleed the cost of carry on the trade. Well, in that it, because of the forwards and stuff, yeah. But I think the idea here is if you want to short something and you want to sleep at night and you want to 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 survive, it's much better to buy puts on Tesla. The the problem uh, that many people have is that they say. And this is something that I always, you know, complain to the banks when they send you uh, zero cost uh, strat uh, strategies. Yeah, buy the put, finance it by selling a call. I always say, guys, this is not zero cost. This is zero premium. Okay. Yes. Now, and this is something that can make you again uh, bankrupt because you go like, okay, I'm I'm bearish Tesla. If you sell it outright, you have a problem because it can go up 10 times and whatever, you're gone. So that's a problem. If you buy the put, obviously the put is gonna be expensive. Nobody wants to pay that money up front. It feels like you've already lost it. 
And so some people decide to finance those puts by selling calls, which effectively is short outright. So it's the same. And, and, and so you blow up. But the key thing here is if you're disciplined, okay, and it, obviously timing is very tricky. You know, you could think about buying puts on Tesla or calls on the VIX or whatever. It's, it's very difficult to, to time these things correctly. But if you have every three months just bought at the money puts and you keep doing it okay, at 100 and 300 and 500 and 700 and 900, you look pretty stupid for a long time, but you're still alive and solvent, okay? Because you have been losing minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. At, at one point, people are like, dude, are you crazy? And then boom, you make plus 10 or plus 20, right? So I think for when you fight these bubbles, it's like holding your breath, you know? Fighting these bubbles, it's extraordinarily difficult because they will go for longer and higher than anybody expects. But when they go down, they go way faster and right. way lower than anybody anticipates. So I think the key thing is to think long-term. Right. Okay? If you're playing these bubbles, of course, everybody knows uh, this is a bubble, and then you decide to short it outright, you are then at the, uh, you're now path dependent, you could blow up. If you give yourself the benefit of time and to say, look, let's be prudent about this, let's, let, let's understand that maybe I'm early and, and, and size the position accordingly, and, in, and particularly by buying options, I think is better. But look, Tesla hasn't been easy because you have, as you mentioned, the forward uh, against you, you have a very high volatility. So shorting Tesla has been extraordinarily difficult for whoever's tried it. And, uh, and therefore, it's, it's um, perhaps better uses of your money to, to fight the bubble. Right. Why not go into the anti-bubble? I mean, come on, guys, gold at these levels, for anybody that is worried about inflation and all the issues, I think gold is, we're going to look back in time and say, oh, my God, you know, how crazy were we? we you know, gold was uh, under 1700 just a few weeks ago. I mean, this is over 20, 25% of the highs from the summer as inflation is creeping higher. You know, so should you, should you fight the, is it better to short Tesla or to buy something that is grossly artificially cheap? What's the mirror image of Tesla? Okay, is it buying Volkswagen? I don't know. I mean, is it buying gold? Is it what, what? So I think just thinking more broadly, you can actually uh, go long or short things directly or indirectly and it's the art of finding that right instrument and the timing, right. but it's not easy. It's, 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 there's definitely, as a good friend of mine would say, it's, it's an art, not a science, but it helps to know a lot of science <laughs> because you know <laughs> these options and programs can be, and understanding the relative value might allow you to get the same thing with, with lower bleed, and, and, and this is what we humbly try right. to do. These are such important points, and 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 I think very well said. And I would just say a little bit more broadly uh, for people who are watching, uh, even if you, they disagree with your thesis on Bitcoin, this is such important wisdom. And one of the things that I think we try to do here on Real Vision uh, is to bring people on, uh, you know, for example, who come uh, from the computer science side, who have a view, a vision about what the future might look like but also people such as yourself, Diego, who have decades of experience expressing a view, expressing a thesis, and understanding how to position that trade and how to do it in a way that maximizes your upside and minimizes your downside. Even if you disagree with uh, the things that Diego is saying here today about Bitcoin, these are such incredibly important points that come from the hard lessons learned for decades in this space. I, I, I can't agree more. I think, you know, I, I, I could say that being, uh, being older than probably the average uh, people in this show, uh, I started my career in the, in the mid late nineties and I went through the dot com in, in first hand. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I must say, you know, you look through the parallels of lots of things that are happening. Right. And it's extraordinary just to see, I, I was, I was that guy. <laughs> back in the dot com making all these mistakes and i've yeah. seen colleagues of mine at jp morgan saying oh man 
I'm in the office here. You know, why do I do this? I'm making more money trading uh, the, the, these stocks than, than why do I need to go in the office? And, and you saw people resigning from JP Morgan to day trade this thing, thinking they were geniuses. Jesus. And I was like, what the hell's your problem? I mean, everybody's a genius in this kind of, uh, of markets. And then things turn around and people... Uh, so it's, it's the, you know, this time around is obviously way bigger in, in, you know, social media and all these things are greatly contributing. But I look at the parallels and, and that's why I insist, guys, whatever you do, don't sell puts on this stuff, okay? Because it, it's almost the worst thing that could happen to you is that you're successful the first few times and you buy the dip and you know you feel infallible and oh my god i feel stupid all these memes of you know the guy who bought the dip and didn't and and so these things eventually it's just probabilistic you know volatility will spike you know things will happen and and it doesn't really matter if, you know if, if you're correct or not five or ten years out if the market takes you out Right. This is about staying in the ring, making sure you protect your capital. And the minute you feel that you're emotionally either too happy or too uh, upset, you're trading too big. Right. You're trading too big. You are 100% trading too big. The optimal point, this is almost like in the table, you know, eating by the time, you know, this is about finding that, that spot of, uh, you know, I am content with whatever happens in the market. If you're long Bitcoin and you're in the right size, if it goes up, you'll be okay. And if it goes down, you'll be okay. The yeah. minute the minute you're emotionally so attached to this and so nervous and so excited and you're the best in the world and then the day after this, you have a big problem because emotions are driving your trading and you're just simply trading too big. And if you have direct leverage, okay, direct leverage through greed or ego, how can I... I told my mother and everybody to put their money and now it's going down. And then how can I now tell them that I'm wrong and that I sold and they didn't. And therefore I'm going to buy more. And I'll just look guys, you need to be flexible, leave the ego on the door, be careful with the leverage. This is, I cannot say it, uh, you know, more clearly, yeah. even, even with, with gold, which I believe will be, you know, three to 5,000 in three to five years. I mean, if you were max, max uh, leverage long gold, you're already out. I mean, come on. If someone in the summer told us we're going to print seven trillion and Biden would win and everything would happen, and they tell you gold will be sixteen hundred, you'd be laughing. Say, come on, man, it's going to be a three k. No, it didn't, and it might be a three k eventually, but it went to sixteen hundred first. And so, you know, yeah. you want to find a situation where you know the emotions, the ego, the position sizing are uh, in, uh, done in a way. And all these lessons, uh, I've, I've seen them in 01, I've seen them in other crises, but this one on the crypto space is the closest to 01 than, than anything else. Absolutely. And I can tell you, I can tell you other, other similarities, for example, 2008, right? So 2008, those who were around, remember, this is securitization. So, so you could take a bunch of, 100 pieces of garbage, cut it into pieces and you would get some gold. Yeah, that was kind of the thesis, some AAA stuff. And then people got so hooked up with the miracle and the alchemy of securitization yeah. that we started to do securitization on securitized products. Yeah, you remember the, CDO, C the CDO squared. You remember CDO squared. You know what CDO squared is today? Do you? <laughs> I, I, well, I mean, it's not- NFTs. NF NFTs, okay? <laughs> NFT is CDO squared. Why? Because now you're telling me that a piece of uh, digital art is worth 69 million just because it's in the blockchain. Yeah. I know, I know you can have thousands of copies, billions of copies, and I can have it, but this one's the only one in the blockchain, therefore this is worth 69 million. This is CDO squared, is people believe so much in CDO that now they lever on the CDO technology. Yeah. And guys, these things blow up spectacularly. So whoever paid 69 million for that piece, uh, good luck. <laughs> well, fortunately, uh, it was not me. 
Uh, <laughs> you know, look, I, 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 I hear you, and it, you can you can argue this both ways. I think NFTs. I think that the you know personally, my view is that the kind of the collectibles art version of NFTs is probably the weakest use case. The thing that I find most interesting about NFTs is the potential uh, to create these non-fungible tokens where you can securitize cash flows and do things uh, in ways where you can programmatically guarantee uh, that there are assets behind them with dollar-backed stable coins and some other uh, technologies that are just coming online. I think it's extremely, extremely early. It's entirely possible uh, that some of these uh, NFTs, especially these spectacular sales that we've seen, uh, are leverage on top of leverage. And, you know, to your point, I remember I was there uh, in uh, 99, 2000. I was working at Credit Suisse at the time. I was just maximally leveraged the lifestyle. I remember I had my apartment in New Jersey that I kept. I moved into the Chelsea Hotel during the week here because prices were only going up. My career was only going up. Nothing could ever possibly go wrong, right? There was this long trajectory toward, and it was in many ways some of the same arguments uh, that we're hearing today. Now, look, with all of that said, I really think that we are in a new age. I really think that we are. Uh, the I agree. potential to create new value through networks, absolutely incredible. Uh, and I really do believe, and I'm massively leveraged this space, and that I'm, you know, I'm spending 60, 70, 80 hours a week thinking about this because I really believe that this I is. Think, uh, I think I think there's a very look. One of my best friends, we're having a phenomenal um, conversation over over dinner this last weekend, and there's three of us. Uh, one is a super techy guy and super smart and CEO of a big company. The other one is a, a very senior guy, advisor, strategic advisor for a for a major telecom. And we're having this fantastic discussion, and and uh, we have three very different perspectives, very complementary. And uh, my friend, the, the technology guy, was is more pro Bitcoin and pro technology. And, and and what the point we're trying to make is that technology is unstoppable, 100% unstoppable. Think about the energy market. Okay, it's it's unstoppable. The, the, the technology to basically produce more for less, to consume less. The cars are more efficient. The technology is unstoppable, and I am—I'm an engineer, and I'm the biggest believer in technology. Right. Technology will change the world. However, when you apply this to currencies, for example, and we talk about central bank currencies (CBDCs), right? This idea that people have that central bank uh, digital currencies are bullish are a confirmation of crypto. They don't even know what they're talking about in the sense that look. If you think about the potential abuse that we've seen with fiat, it's going to be exponentially bigger. Why? Because now, if you have a digital euro or a digital yuan, you're going to be able to print infinite amount of yuan instantly, and you're going to have you're going to be able to impose negative interest rates at will. Today, with a physical note of 500 euros, you can actually take that euro, put it in your pocket for 10 years, and you've paid 0% interest. If you're an institutional client and you part that money with uh, with bonds, you lost 10%. Right. <laughs> okay, through negative yields. So right. they didn't take out uh, the 500 euro note because of terrorism. That was the excuse, right? It's uh, money laundering, it's terrorism. The thing is, if I have 500 euro notes, people can store a ton of money. We need to right. get rid of, of physical uh, uh, paper. So yeah. the thing with seniorage and the privilege that Elon Musk wants to have with Doge, right, that central banks have is so huge right. and so valuable that think about technology is unstoppable, but think about the governments and their power. Uh, this idea uh, from utopian idea that you're outside of the system, guys, you're paying taxes, you will pay taxes. Don't think you're out of the system. They will come for you. So yeah. make sure whatever you do, you put your taxes aside. Second, we've seen uh, in Turkey and India and other places when things have become a little bit bad, it's been banned. Okay? Yeah. So it becomes illegal tender, which means you can't hold it. It's illegal. You and, can't it, and, do it has, it. and it hasn't stopped the accumulation of those positions. Diego, I have to get going soon here because my producers and editors are going to be up until <laughs> 2 o'clock in the morning working if we don't go soon. But I have to say this, this has been an absolutely incredible conversation. I think everyone uh, who's watching knows that I'm incredibly bullish on the space, but the points that you've raised here, I think are just an incredibly important counterpoint. You know, you've said this 
uh, in a number of different ways. But this isn't about emotion. It's about reason. It's about understanding ways of looking at it. And you've raised so many uh, incredibly important uh, points here today, uh, points that have been, you know, that you've come to through years, years and decades of being in the macro space, of being in the investment space. And I think these are incredibly important points. And, and let me just end here uh, by saying, again, obviously not financial advice, uh, but whatever happens to the price uh, of Doge, I can assure you that Elon Musk, uh, I can assure you uh, that the other billionaires, Mark Cuban, for example, who I'm a great fan of, they are not going to have a hard time paying their rent if it goes to zero. And that is really the key point here. And I just want to end by reading through, uh, once again, your, your tweet on this point, because I think it's so important and something that everyone, myself included, everyone really needs to hear and think about and understand. You say, mind your leverage. Invest only what you can afford to lose. Don't buy leveraged futures. Don't sell puts. Don't borrow to buy more. Don't mortgage your assets. Leverage equals highway to bankruptcy. Stay solvent. Uh, I couldn't agree more. It's almost like I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Diego, we're going to have to have you come back to Real Vision Crypto so we can do an even deeper dive, so we can do you know 90 minutes or more to get really explore this, because there's so much that we didn't get a chance to discuss here, uh, and we'd really love to have you back. It'd be my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, and uh, good luck, everybody. Stay Thank healthy. You. Thank you again for joining Thank you again. us. Thank you again. Thank you for watching, everyone. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you for participating. We appreciate it. All the best. Thank Bye. you, guys. Uh...